Hey, and welcome. I'm Todd, and we're going to continue a study today uh, entitled Practical Christianity. And the goal really is just to take a lot of topics that we know and that we have studied and look at some practical application of them just uh, to daily living. And today we're going to look at the concept uh, of faith. And we're going to read a lot of the verses that you're familiar with related to faith and just understand exactly what we do with it. What is it that, what is it we take from that uh, to apply? So we'll look there. We'll start on James 2 here in just a minute. Let's pray and then we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for every blessing you give us. We're thankful for this time that we have to be together and to study your word. We're thankful that you have given us your word and that you have preserved it in a way that we can all learn it and we can live lives in your service. We're thankful more than anything for your son, Jesus, and we pray through him. And amen. All right, so like I said, let's turn to James 2, and we're going to start there. And we're going to read all the usual suspects here as far as verses are concerned. But I want to look at them. It would not be possible for me to spend 30 minutes here and do a full study of faith and the concept of faith. I'm going to base today's study on the fact that you already know a little bit about faith and that obviously you are good Bible students. But I want to just talk about it from a perspective of when we read these things, about faith, what does it compel us to do? What is it that um, it does to our daily living? And so that's the goal of what we're gonna to study today when we look at some of these verses. And we'll start in James 2, which is obviously one of the most practical um, studies in faith, but I wanna look there and, and we'll take some tangents from there. So let's start in uh, James 2 and starting in verse 14. It says, what use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? In the same way, faith, al faith also, if it has no works, being by itself is dead. So, this, this verse here, um, we're going to start there just for a moment. And this verse really gives us a good idea about the nature of faith. And what we're looking at here is a reaction that people had when they lived under the old law and works was everything. Works was how a person obtained salvation. And so he teaches them here that, okay, now that you have been relieved of a religion based on works, where salvation comes from works, you have gone so far the other way now that you act as if uh, faith and works are completely mutually exclusive. And so that's what he teaches here. He says, uh, what use is it if someone says he has faith but has no works? And the example he gives here is a really good place to start for us, I think. When he says, if a, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, yet does not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? And it's so, this is so practical to me, this idea that says, um, if you say that you have faith, but then when you see someone in need and all you do is just give them words, you just like, you know, good luck to you. You know, hope, hope the food thing works out okay for you. Um, it's a demonstration that you don't have faith. That's how you can identify a person who doesn't have faith. If they're not willing to do something to help a person in need. <clears throat> the question is asked, then what do you have faith in? What use is it that you have faith if you're not willing to just do those basic things? <clears throat> the new law from Christ is very clearly a freedom from the old law. It's, it is freedom from having to perform works in order to obtain salvation. That was a great freedom to them and that it allowed the Gentiles who did not have that law to come in. And so I feel like we have to look here at, a, take a little tangent and look at this idea of being relieved of the law. That is not of having freedom from the, the old law. So let's go to Galatians 3. We're going to read a significant section of Galatians 3 so that we can see how Paul talks about they're uh, being emancipated from the old law. And so let's look there. We'll start in verse 1 of Galatians 3 and read a, read a few passages there. It says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? 
This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you <clears throat> do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So let's stop there. We're going to go a little further here in Galatians 3. But to me, that this opening, I, I've taught this a number of times because I just love the way that it's portrayed here, where he says, yeah, you foolish Galatians. He's like, what in the world are you doing? You are over here acting like still you are saved by the law. You have been given Christ. You have been given the Spirit. And still you act like it's the law that saves you. And he says, are you so foolish that having begun by the Spirit, you're being perfected in the flesh? It's like you've been saved by the Spirit. And now you're trying to go back and do all the works of the law to be saved. How could you do that? And why would you want to do that? It's so interesting how he puts that here. But he says to them, you've been bewitched. All these other teachers were coming along and teaching them that they needed to abide by the law, even though they'd been saved in Christ. And he was saying, they called that being bewitched. It's almost like, who tricked you? Who conned you into thinking that? But let's continue on here. And he says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham. The believer. Stop there for just a moment. This is another, uh, he says here, Abraham believed in God. This is this reference to Genesis 15, where it says it was credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. This is like a foreshadowing. He says, these people were taught this same salvation through faith. And it says it was taught to him by saying, all nations will be blessed in you. So that promise that was made to Abraham, it says, was a promise of this foreseeing of salvation by faith. That's how all the nations of the earth would be blessed, by not having to abide by the works of the law in order to be saved. That's how faith works. It is freedom from the law. We are not saved by works. It is we are saved through faith in God. So it says here that this was known beforehand. Now, he continues on here to talk a little more about how the law was a problem, how this was something they needed to be freed from. So we'll continue on here. And it says, For all who were of works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous one will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith, on the contrary. The person who performs them will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that he would receive the promise of the, of the Spirit through faith. So this now here just uses this term. It says, You were cursed by the law. It says, when Because we are freed now from that, we have been free from a curse. In fact, it says all those who were of works of law were under a curse. So it's like you having to live by the law, having to live and do the works of the law to be saved was a curse. Because if you broke it, you're dead. If you did not fulfill the law perfectly, you were dead. Out. And so he said it's a curse. So the freedom of Christ is now we do not have to perfectly follow the law in order to be saved. We're going to talk a lot more about that here in a minute. But I hope you see that, that how important it is that we take this little tangent to Galatians and say, being relieved of the law and having to fulfill the law in order to be saved was a great gift to us. But then when we look back in James, we see that their freedom, they took it too far. So in Galatians 3, it was the opposite. In Galatians 3, they were going back to the law. They're gravitating back to the law to do that because they had been taught wrong. But let's turn back to James 2 again here. And it talks about this idea that says, <clears throat> if you just say faith, if I say I have faith and I expect that to save me, but I'm not willing to do anything as a result of my faith, then it's a worthless faith. And so we see the other aspect of it in James. Let's continue on in James. We, we just read about the fact 
that if we, if we um, see a person who's in need and we don't help them, actively do tangible things to help them, then our faith is worthless. And he continues on and says that a little bit further. He says, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called, uh, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was Rahab the prostitute not justified by works also when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. I know that's a long section, but you can see how it, it really encapsulates what we're trying to teach here. Um, this idea that says if you say you have faith but are not doing the things of God, then it's worthless. It's not even faith. He defines faith here as, first of all, seeing a person in need and doing what's required to help them. That's faith. That's an act of faith. He moves on here and he says, some of you might say, I have faith, and another says, I have works. And he says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And this is almost like people are having an argument during this time period where they have spiritual gifts, and they're saying, well, my gift is faith. Another person says, I have the gift of works, and they're acting as if they're two separate things, as if you can say, um, I have just faith, I have just the gift of faith, or I have just the gift of works. And so he says, no, these are not two things that are separated. It's you have faith through works, and your works are by faith. And so he, this idea that he puts those things together is really important here. And he goes and shows examples about Abraham. You want to know how Abraham had faith? Look what he did. You want to know how if Rahab had faith? Well, look what she did. And then he ends with saying, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. We cannot separate and say that faith is by itself something. Faith creates something. The outcome of faith is daily activities that demonstrate it. And so we might refer to it as a lifestyle of faith, that it is a living faith that is what saves us. And so that's what we look at at James 2 here, the idea that people were um, living this new, this new law of freedom from the, you know, this, it's, it's this law of freedom from the law. And what they were doing instead was just nothing. They were just saying, all I've got is faith and acting like that was something. And he said, it's worthless unless you do something with it. So we've looked at that. We've looked at the idea that we read in Galatians uh, 3. Let's turn now to Ephesians 2. And I want to read a section in, in Ephesians 2 that helps us understand a little bit more about what faith does, what the outcome of faith is. So let's look at uh, Ephesians 2 and start in verse 4. It says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." So I want to look at this verse. Clearly, it's a, it's a very important verse when it comes to understanding grace and faith and the relationship of those. And you know that, you know that there is a, a worldwide debate among religious people about faith only versus works only. There, that there are religious organizations who all fight um, to say salvation is by faith only or salvation is by works only, or it is by some combination of them. And, that, it, and you can see that we've already just read three verses here, and they all take a different slant at this idea of faith. The one says that the law is a curse and that we should not try to be saved through works. And the other says that if we try to have just faith and we don't have the lifestyle that comes along with it, it's worthless. 
And so we have to stop trying to create some debate argument uh, about this. this is, the, the teaching here is clear. Ephesians 2 to me is very helpful. First of all, it starts off by establishing that the grace of God saves us. It says, God is so merciful that when we were dead in our wrongdoings, it's it, this idea of when we lived lives that caused us to be completely lost and helpless, he made us alive. He gave us life through Christ. So this idea that because we had uh, not kept the law, we were dead. But he came to us with Christ and brought us grace. So the idea of grace here just being that he provides us an avenue for salvation, even though we have, have, are incapable of earning it. We are incapable of obtaining it ourselves. He gives it to us through Christ. And it says that, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So this helps us to understand the relationship that says, even though we must have faith, even though that faith must be a lifestyle, an active faith, it is not what obtains salvation. It is not the, that faith, because well, once again, people can say, well, you could just act like having faith is the work you do in order to obtain salvation. And that is not how it works at all. It doesn't even make sense. It says, we have been saved through faith by grace. And he says it is the gift of God, not as a, not as a result of works. And it says we, that it is, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So it's this idea that says it's just who we are, that when you act on your faith, it defines you. It says who you are. So I want to just talk about this idea here that says faith is not the gift that he's referring to. Us having faith is not the gift. It is the mechanism by which grace is delivered. It is when we have faith, it equips grace and salvation to be delivered to us. That's very subtle, I know, but that's exactly what it says here. Um, I read uh, someone who said something interesting. It said, <clears throat> if you have a hose, a garden hose, I remember when I used to and lived in Houston in the summertime, we would swim in the backyard and we would and you know, spend a lot of time outside in the backyard. And I still remember but dying of thirst, just being so thirsty and going and drinking out of the garden hose. And I still remember exactly what the water in the garden hose tasted like, but I was so thirsty that I just needed to, to get that hose going and drink out of it. And I heard someone talk about the fact that faith is not the water that you're drinking that, is, that you're thirsty for. Uh, faith is the hose that delivers the water. This water that's, that saves, the water that comes out of it is like this salvation that God's giving, that he's giving through his grace. And so the gift itself is salvation. The gift is God saving us. Grace is why he does it. You know, he, he, is, he is merciful and graceful. That's, that is what motivates him to do it. Faith is what delivers it. Our faith is what allows it to be delivered. And this verse, I think, just talks about that very well. But it, to, the relationship between those things is so important. By grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of ourselves. It's, it, it is God giving it to us. It's not from works that we do. But faith produces works. That's what it does. So let's continue on here, and, and, and I, and I want to say that we, as we go on here, we're going to look at some of these verses that are pretty cl cliche now, because we're going to Hebrews 11, which we all call the faith passage. Uh, but we need to look at this from the perspective of what is the outcome, but what is it that we're doing with this? So let's start in, in verse 1 of Hebrews 11 and read there. Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen, for by it the people of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the world has been created by the word of God so that what is seen has not been made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered, a God, offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he was attested to be righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For before he was taken up, he was attested to have been pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he, pr- and that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. Okay, so we'll stop there. And so in Hebrews 11, we see you know, so much good insight about this idea of faith and what it is and, and having an active faith. But it starts off with a very basic definition that is extremely useful. It starts off by saying, now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. And the, the, putting these two things up against each other is what's important to understand here. So the idea of saying on one side we have certainty, or your version may say assurance, of things hoped for. Then it says the proof or evidence of things not seen. And so on one side we have assurance and certainty and evidence and proof. On the other side, we have things that are hoped for and things that are not seen. And so that's, what, that's to me, a really good way of thinking about faith. It is having a certainty, an assurance, a confidence, treating something like we have evidence for it, even if we don't. And we'll talk more about the evidence side of it here in a minute. I don't mean to act like there's no evidence. But I want to say that what this teaches us is that we are treating things that we only hope for, that we don't have empirical evidence for necessarily, as if we do, as if we have proof. That's the amount of confidence we have in it. And so then it talks about, about by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. And then it talks about Enoch being taken up and this, these people that were pleasing to God because of their faith and says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I think it's so important that we understand here what faith did, because it says that when you have the um, assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, it says by that people gained approval. They, they were rendered righteous, righteous being that is we are in good condition with God. You know, I, that's too simple a definition I know, but I, I use the word righteous just to say I'm right with God. I'm in a good place with him. They were put into this place with God, even saying that it, you know, that people were pleasing to God and people were known as being faithful to God because of their faith. And we look at them and I think it's so important that we notice that what they did was in extremely difficult circumstances, dire circumstances, very difficult, they were hopeful and enduring. That these people, when we look back at the, when we see Abraham, when we see uh, Rahab, and we see the other examples that we looked at a minute ago, um, this idea says that these people were in very difficult, dire circumstances, sometimes life-threatening circumstances, but they were hopeful and confident and they endured. That to me is practical daily living faith. This is why there was a responsibility of Christians to have a positive, um, optimistic, happy, peacemaking attitude. Christians are not people who spend a lot of time in the depths of a despair. Now, everyone goes through hard times. Everyone goes through spells where it's, it, their lives are very difficult and they're down. And, and I don't mean to diminish in any way that people can get down and depressed and that it's very legitimate. But Christians base their outlook on faith. Christians work on a positive outlook, a positive attitude, an optimistic, upbeat attitude because they have confidence in something greater. And once again, I don't want to diminish in any way that people go through hard times and people have are down and struggle with that. But our outlook on life is based on confidence in God, in assurance of things that we hope for in the future. That, so that hope is what drives us. So that's all I really want to take out of, of uh, Hebrews 11, that this, um, and, and when it, when it finishes, finishes up here and says, without faith it is impossible to please him, for the one who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. That this is that faith in a faithful God. We trust God. We know that he is going to prove what he says. And we are so confident, we trust him so much that we have hope, that that's the outcome. And so we'll see more of that as we, as we continue here. But I want to turn over to uh, one last verse here and look at Romans 10. And we'll look the read there starting in verse 5. So let's look over at Rome, uh, Romans 10 starting in verse 5. 
For Moses writes of the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who performs them will live by them. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raises him from the dead, you will be saved. For the heart, a person, uh, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who care on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so we're, we're looking here, and we're going to continue on here in just a moment. We're seeing here this picture that says, um, we do not accomplish righteousness through doing stuff. Now, doing things is an important part of what comes out of our faith, but salvation and righteousness are not accomplished through doing stuff or not doing stuff. Those may be things that are expected of us. Those may be things that are part of our being right with God, but they do not, that does not accomplish righteousness. This verse tells us what does accomplish that. It says... Um, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. This is the idea that says there are two things that go into the outcome of faith. A faithful person that believes is righteous. A person who confesses will be saved. And confession, the definition of confession is really important. That confession does have to do with admitting when you've done something wrong. Uh, that is part of confession. But when it talks about it here, confession means saying the same thing. It means to say the same thing. And so it says here, saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is what results in salvation. Once again, I'm not trying to say that just saying that causes salvation. Not just believing and just confessing Jesus, that those, those specific things don't by themselves result in salvation. But it's talking here about a holistic approach that says a person who believes, it brings about righteousness. A person who confesses Jesus Christ, it brings about salvation. And we've seen already all the correlating verses that tell us what a person with faith does, how a person with faith lives, that it is a person who is active, a person who when they see someone in need, they deal with it, a person who is uh, constantly acting like a child of God. It is a person who is so faithful that they have a positive outlook, that they are loving, and that they are um, looking for those good deeds to do. And that, that, that's the kind of person that God sees as his child. Let's continue on and just read um, the rest of this because it ends with one of the most common verses about faith or most well-known. It says, How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. This verse here sometimes I think is oversimplified to say um, faith comes from the Bible. If you read the Bible, then um, just have faith in that and you'll be saved. And that and there's nothing wrong with that. There's, that's the true statement. But this idea of faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God, you see what it comes from. It comes from the fact that in that time period, it was all hearing. There was nobody that said, read your Bible. There wasn't, there wasn't this, um, you need to make sure you spend every day in Bible study. That would have meant nothing to them. They had no idea what that meant. It was about hearing to them. And so that's why the preacher was so important. It says you need to have a preacher who has the word with them that goes and reads it. And so when you, it says hearing and hearing, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. That means when people are reading the word, when people are coming around and, and, and preaching the word, listen to them. And when you hear it, believe it and act on it. 
That's the idea of faith is comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. Nowadays, it might say faith comes from reading the word and reading the word of Christ. We have it available to us now, but at the time, that's why he said hearing. Listen to what it, the gospel is. When the people preach the gospel, listen and take action on it. The idea of faith here that we see in Romans 10 is about knowing God and making a commitment. It is belief and confession. We believe in God. We, we have faith and hope. And because we believe in God, we make a commitment. And that's a really important part to me of, uh, of this, that the commitment is the outcome of faith. Now I want to talk for a minute here as we finish up about some things that faith is not. And so I want, to, I want to just say, these are three things, and this is, of course, just, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is, I just want to talk about three things that faith is not. First of all, first of all, faith is not church attendance. And I don't mean to say that church attendance is not important and that assembling with Christians is not important, but sometimes what we do is directly relate faith to attendance. Now, is a person's lack of attendance an indicator of where their faith is at or the strength of their faith? Sure, absolutely. But we cannot just say that if a person is not attending that, that, is, that, that they're equals, that, that it's the exact same thing. Because here's the problem with that. A person who does attend does not necessarily mean they have faith. Does not necessarily mean that's a demonstration of faith. So we can't, all I'm saying is we cannot make those things equal. Secondly, faith is not sinlessness. Clearly from what we've read here, we do not accomplish faith through perfect sinlessness. It's impossible. We cannot make those things equal, that when a person sins, they have lost their faith. It is important when a person who's living a sinful life, it is an indicator about the strength of their faith, but we cannot make those things equals, that faith is not equal sinlessness. And also, I would say faith is not a feeling. Just because you have struggles and doubts or you worry about things does not mean you have lost your faith. Faith is not a feeling that you have all the time that proves things to you. Faith is a commitment, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. The only other thing I'll mention that I like to say, which I, I, I know this is a dangerous thing to say, but faith is also not obtaining proof. That's not faith. I see a lot of people who work really hard at reading all the books on evidences and going to all the seminars and watching all the videos, and some of them pride themselves in there being so much evidence that it's proved and that we should be able to take these evidences and go and tell them to people, take it with the gospel and say, well, not only do we have the gospel, but we also have all of these evidences to prove that the Bible is true or to prove. And I'm not diminishing the quality of the evidences. I'm not saying that we don't have really good ones and that they're not really useful and they're not very helpful. But our goal is not to obtain scientific proof of the gospel in order to teach it. That's not how the gospel works. That is not how righteousness works. Righteousness is based on faith. And so I wanted to mention that, not because I'm diminishing evidence's teaching or the quality of it, or the um, quantity of it even. It's just that we cannot rely on us finding scientific proof or historical proof in order to make faith possible though it can embolden faith. I would, the only thing I would like to say, if I'm going to define, and I don't want you to act like this is the definition, but this is the best definition I can come up with about how we apply it. Faith is trusting God enough that we commit our lives to doing what's right. And once again, I'm not trying to act like that's the, the definition. It's just one I'd like to use from our study today. It's trusting God so much that you commit your life to doing what's right. I think a lot about 1 Corinthians 10 and about God and how faithful he is in that he's not faithful because he does all the good things. He's faithful because he does exactly what he says he's going to do every time. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore let one who thinks he stands watch out that he does not fall. 
No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. I just talk here about where it says God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted. This is a God who does what he says he's going to do every single time. He is deserving of our faith, is what that says. He is faithful. He, he is trustworthy. And so to me, that helps embolden us to say, I trust him. I know that he will do exactly what he says he's going to do. And I trust him so much that I'm going to commit my life to doing what's right. That I'm going to commit my life to doing what he tells me I should do. So we've only scratched the surface on the idea of faith, but I hope that, that it's been helpful to you. I hope that just looking at these verses from the perspective of what is the outcome of faith is something that's useful to you. So I appreciate you being here today and studying with me. We'll look forward to studying with you again next time.